Jennings Goes to School was written by Anthony Buckridge shortly after the end of the Second World War. Jennings was ten years old at the time, and he's not grown a day older since. But the story of his life at a boarding school has grown so much that it's become a minor industry in itself. More than 20 books about him have been published, and about 2 million copies have been sold. He's been translated into 12 languages, and translated too into radio, television, film and stage productions, and now onto cassette tape. Jennings School is called Linbury Court, a preparatory school somewhere in Sussex. The author, Anthony Buckridge, was himself a schoolmaster when he began writing the saga. He adapted this version of Jennings Goes to School, and he reads the story. It was the first afternoon of the Christmas term, and Mr. Carter was enjoying the peace and stillness so soon to be shattered by the arrival of 67 boys on the school train. A few had already arrived by car and were memorising the contents of the notice board in order to be first with the news when the main body arrived. Mr Carter was greeted enthusiastically by the group at the notice board. Oh, sir, how are you, sir? Have you had a decent holiday, sir? Twelve times Mr Carter shook hands. Twelve times he was pleased to say that his health was excellent. He moved on, his right hand somewhat stickier than before. Mr Carter returned to his room just as the patter of little feet announced that the main body had arrived by the school train. The little feet pattered up the stairs like a cavalry regiment thundering across the plain, and the master was once more the centre of noisy greeting. Have you had a decent holiday, sir? Yes, thank you, Temple. So did we, sir, said Temple. We went to Guernsey by air. It was super. Uh, actually, it was a rotten swizzle, sir, because we flew through low cloud and we couldn't see a thing. But if it hadn't been for that, and if we'd flown about a hundred miles further east, I could have wiped this school right off the map, sir, honestly. Really, marvelled Mr. Carter. If I'd had a machine gun, that is, Temple explained. We seem to have had a narrow escape. Mr. Carter proceeded to shake hands all round and furtively wiped the damp stickiness from his palm on his handkerchief. Line up, he said. I want your health certificates, money for the bank, and trunk keys. Order was restored, and Mr. Carter started to check each boy's belongings. Right, said Mr. Carter. Next boy. Me, sir, please, sir, said a voice. Mr. Carter's first meeting with Jennings was the routine affair of a busy master who saw in front of him a small boy not unlike the dozens of other small boys who were lined up outside his room. His dark brown hair, which still bore the faintest trace of a parting, was no different from that of his fellows, and his face was the average sort of face worn by boys of his generation. So Mr. Carter learned little from this first meeting. Later on, he was to learn a lot. A new boy, eh? said Mr. Carter. And what's your name? Jennings, sir. Oh, yes. There you are on the list. J.C.T. Jennings, ten years, two months. Right? No, sir. Not quite right, sir. Ten years, two months, and three days last Tuesday, sir. Well, we shall have to get someone to show you the ropes, shan't we? Come here, Venables, the master said to an untidy-looking boy of twelve. I want you to show Jennings round. On my left, he proclaimed in the manner of the best boxing referees. On my left, Venables easily distinguished by his trailing shoelaces. On my right, Jennings, who's got to be looked after. Venables, Jennings, Jennings, Venables. As though to heighten this sporting comparison, a bell rang in the distance. There's the tea bell, said the self-styled referee. Take Jennings to the dining hall, show him his classroom and his dormitory, and treat him as you would your best friend. Yes, sir, replied the trailer of shoelaces. On second thoughts, don't, added Mr. Carter. I've seen how you treat your best friend. Look after him as you do yourself, and he certainly won't go hungry. Some 
Some time after tea, another bell rang, and Jennings followed his guide upstairs to Dormitory 4. You sleep here next to this other new chap, Venables explained. Hey, you, what's your name? Charles Edwin Jeremy Derbyshire, said the other new chap, a fair-haired boy in glasses. I've never been away to school before, and I... Well, don't make speeches about it. You've only got ten minutes to get into bed, Venables told him. The dormitory was a small one. There were five beds with a chair beside each, three wash basins by the window, and a large mirror in a dark corner of the room. What's the matter with you, Derbyshire? asked Temple. Nothing, said Derbyshire. Well... Well, well, nothing much, except I, I, I don't like this place. When I'm at home, my father always comes and talks to me when I'm in bed, and, well, it, it, it's all so different here, isn't it? I'll say it's different, said Atkinson. Wait till you get into old Wilkie's maths class. He gets in a super bait. He goes like this. Oh, you silly little boy! Don't you know the angles of the base of an isosceles triangle are jolly nearly equal? Write it out a hundred and fifty million times before tea. The impersonation was interrupted by a bell ringing in the distance. Wow, that's the five minutes bell Atkinson finished up. Come on, let's get washed. Five boys and three wash basins worked out at an impractical fraction. So tradition required that the old hands should wash first while the new boys waited until their turn came. Come on, you chaps, get a move on, said Venables. Mr. Carter's on duty and he... He broke off, affronted by a shocking disregard for tradition. Here, Jennings, he cried indignantly. What are you doing at that basin? Washing, said Jennings. But you can't have that basin first. It's Temple's. He bagged it last term. New chaps have to wash last. Well, I'm here now, said Jennings. Temple came rushing across to the Penty's rights. That's my basin, Jennings. Get out, he ordered. Well, I didn't know, said Jennings. You jolly well ought to know. Go on, get out of the way. Jennings refused to be cowed. I was here first, so I'm going to wash first, he said. And he did. I wouldn't stand that from a new chap, said Venables. It's just super hairy cheek. Huh, I'm not going to. Temple was incensed. You wait, Jennings. Just you wait till tomorrow. I'm jolly well going to bash you up. Derbyshire registered a protest. That's not fair. My father says any more from you, Derbyshire, said Temple, and I'll bash you up tomorrow when I finish with Jennings. Silence reigned for a few moments until it occurred to Atkinson that the maximum enjoyment could be wrung from the situation, only if Jennings was made to realise just what was in store for him. I say, Jennings, he said, you're taking on a big job when you get on the wrong side of Temple. Do you know what he did last term? He foxed into town on a bus, and as a super lethal punishment for foxing. Atkinson went on to explain that this notorious feat, which had placed Temple on the dizziest pedestal of fame, had occurred one half-holiday. Quietly slipping away from Mr. Wilkins' cricket practice, he had taken a bus into the town and had gone to Valenti's, a sweet shop which specialised in the manufacture of Brighton Rock. And he brought back ten pennyworth of rock in a bag with the shop's name on to prove he'd been, he finished up in admiring tones. And I wasn't caught either, put in the hero of the exploit. He glowed with pride. Of course, it's quite easy if you've got the nerve. Still, he went on, reluctant to leave the topic. No one else has ever done it. There's no one else who'd dare to, I suppose. He smiled. Oh, Atke, remind me to bash Jennings before tea tomorrow, just in case I forget. It's not fair, Derbyshire protested. And if Derbyshire starts getting uppish, I'll do him as well, said Temple. Derbyshire lay awake that night with black despair in his soul. Whatever sort of a place was this that his father had so mistakenly sent him to? He'd no idea that school was a place where life was governed by clanging bells and threats of being bashed up, where the rules were thwarting and masters made you write things out a hundred and fifty million times. <sighs> Golly, however long would that take? Well, suppose it took you a minute to write it out once. That meant sixty times an hour, and there were twenty-four hours in a day, so that made... Wow! There, but you'd have to stop to eat, wouldn't you? He tried again. After his third calculation, when the answer came to slightly more than 47 years, he fell asleep.
Jennings had only the haziest recollection of the events of the following morning. It seemed as though he spent the time in getting into long lines which moved somewhere whenever a bell sounded. Where the line went, he wasn't sure, but the manoeuvre always ended up by a master asking him his name and how old he was. Jennings had had enough, so he slipped out of the line as it rounded a corner and wandered off by himself. Remembering Temple's threat, he had a vague idea of keeping out of the way until tea time, when, perhaps, the danger would be past. At the far end of the quad, he discovered Derbyshire all by himself. What are you doing here, Derby? he demanded. You ought to be marching about somewhere in a long line. I know, replied Derbyshire, gulping visibly. Streaks of grime down his cheeks told their own story. I say, you, you haven't been crying, have you? No, 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 not really. I've just been wishing I was at home and it's made my glasses go all misty. Huh. You've got nothing to worry about, Jenny consoled him. How about me? I'm due for a bashing up before tea. Well, so am I if I get uppish, Derbyshire replied. And have you been getting uppish? No, no, I've been feeling downish all morning. I, I don't like boarding school. Everything sounds so awful and... Oh, oh, I, I wish I'd never come. Well, I'm not feeling too good either, said Jennings. A brilliant thought struck him. I say, Derbyshire, I've got an idea. Shall we run away? Run away, gasped Derbyshire, stunned by the boldness of the idea. Yes, go home. Then you can tell your father you don't like it here, and my father can tell me how to stand up for myself. But how can we run away, objected the law-abiding Derbyshire. We're not allowed out. Jennings dismissed the objection with a shrug of the shoulders. We could just walk down the drive and get a bus to the station and go home. And we could ask Mr. Carter for our pounds out of bank so we could buy our tickets. But I've only got 96 pence. Oh, that would be masses to buy a ticket with, Jennings assured him. I say, it'll be jolly exciting, won't it? Derbyshire wasn't at all sure that he was cut out for that sort of excitement. Suppose we get caught, he asked anxiously. Jennings considered. Perhaps there was some way of reducing the risk. I know, he said. We could disguise ourselves. Then perhaps even if they saw us, we wouldn't be recognised. What? Beards and false noses and things, gasped Derbyshire. Why not, said Jennings, as though the donning of disguise was an everyday occurrence with him. Bet I haven't got a beard, objected the practical Derbyshire. And anyway, I'd look silly wearing a beard with short trousers. Well, well, perhaps not beards, then, Jennings conceded. But I could wear your glasses, that'd be something. And you could, uh, oh, what could Derbyshire have? You could, you, you could walk with a limp, he decided. For the first time since he had arrived at school, Derbyshire began to enjoy himself. The idea of walking with a limp cheered him up enormously. Oh, yes, he said, all sorrows forgotten, like this look. And with staggering gait, he hobbled round in small circles. Jennings began to feel he'd been over generous. No, bags I walk with the limp, he amended. I can do it better than you. That's not fair, protested Derbyshire. You said I could have it. Besides, you're going to have my glasses, so there won't be anything for me. Well, you won't be wearing your glasses, Jennings argued. But it isn't a disguise just to be not wearing something. OK, then, you can um, oh, turn your collar up. Come on, let's go and find Mr Carter and ask for our money. Full of excited optimism, they dashed into the building and up the stairs to Mr Carter's study. Mr Carter looked up from his desk. Hello, he said. What do you two want? We want some money from the bank, please, sir. I want a pound, and Derbyshire wants whatever it is he's got. That's rather a lot, isn't it? What do you want it for? This was a difficult question. Do we have to say what it's for, sir? Well, a large sum of money like that's a bit unusual. I'm afraid I can't let you have it unless you tell me why. Derbyshire decided that the game was up, but Jennings was made of sterner stuff. Please, sir, he asked, how much could we have without having to tell you what it's for, sir? Oh, I shouldn't be curious up to about five pence, said Mr. Carter, generously. Oh, oh well, well, if that's all, can we have five pence each, then, sir? Mr. Carter gave it to them. You won't spend it on anything foolish, will you, he said. 
He smiled as the door closed on the two conspirators. He already had an idea that something was afoot and decided to hold a watching brief. He opened the door and followed at a discreet distance. On the far side of the quad, Jennings and Derbyshire held another council of war. Well, I suppose that's that, said Derbyshire. And I was feeling quite excited about walking with a limp with my collar turned up. Still, it's all a washout now. No, it isn't, said Jennings. You've got five pence each. That's enough to get to the station on the bus. But what about train fares? Well, we'll go by taxi. We'll get one at the station, and my father will pay when we get there. With Mr. Jennings' cooperation taken for granted, the scheme appeared flawless. The coast was clear. Sounds of activity from the assembly hall indicated that the main body of the school was busily engaged in some communal pursuit. Come on, then, said Jennings. Give me your glasses and turn your collar up. Gosh, Derbyshire, he went on when the spectacles were in position. Your eyesight must be rotten. I can't see a thing with them. Well, well, I can't see a thing without them, complained Derbyshire, peering short-sightedly in all directions. The transfer of the spectacles meant that neither of the boys could see clearly, and they were unaware that Mr. Carter was an interested spectator of their departure. Groping and limping, their sun hats pulled low over their brows, they proceeded down the drive, through the school gates and onto the road. We turn right to get into the town, whispered Jennings. I remember it from yesterday, and I think there's a bus stop somewhere along here. For fifty yards they stumbled uncertainly. Then Jennings bumped into an obstruction which loomed up suddenly before him. I beg your pardon, he apologised to a postmarked bus stop, and again they moved on. After a while Jennings stopped. I can't go on wearing your glasses any longer, Derbyshire, he said. They're giving me a headache. We must be nearly at the bus stop by now. Derbyshire put on his glasses. Yes, there it is, he exclaimed, about twenty yards back. We walked right past it. I can see it quite plainly now. Do you think we need go on limping, said Derbyshire, as they neared the bus stop? It's jolly tiring. OK, said Jennings. And we needn't talk in whispers either, as there's no one about. Oh, golly, there is, he gasped. It's a man. He's coming out of the school gates. Quick, quick, get down. They hurled themselves behind the cover of the hedge. Ow, wailed Derbyshire. Shut up, hissed Jennings. Bet I'm kneeling on a nettle. Keep your head down or he'll see us. Jennings peered cautiously through a gap in the hedge. Oh, heavens, he gasped. It's Mr. Carter and he's coming this way. Lie down and don't move. Mr. Carter strolled slowly along towards the bus stop. Portions of small boy were visible through gaps in the hedge, but he affected not to notice. He was curious to know what the plan was, but he knew that if he were to discover the boys so early in the proceedings, he probably never would know. They would merely stand uncomfortably on one foot and remain silent in the face of questions. He walked past the bus stop, and disappeared round the bend in the road. As the footsteps receded in the distance, Jennings raised his head. He's gone, he whispered. Jolly good job he didn't see us, wasn't it? Are you sure he didn't, inquired Derbyshire anxiously. Of course not. We crouched down, didn't we? Well, then, he couldn't have, possibly. Good, said Derbyshire. I think I'll get off my nettle now, if you don't mind. In the distance, they heard a bus approaching. The bus was a single decker, and it stopped in response to the frantic signals of the two boys. It was fairly full, but two seats in the front were vacant and a man seated near the entrance alighted as Jennings and Derbyshire, with anxious glances down the road, hopped quickly onto the platform and made for the front seats. 
You needn't go on limping now, said Jennings, as Derbyshire lurched forward with a sudden starting of the bus. We'll be passing Mr. Carter in a minute, so we'll have to crouch down very low in our seats. Isn't this fun? But the fun ceased some five seconds later when the bus slowed down. What are we stopping for? asked Derbyshire. We've only just started. I'll have a look, said Jennings, raising his eyes cautiously to the level of the window. The sight that met his gaze chilled the blood in his veins. Mr. Carter was standing in the road with hand upraised to stop the bus. The master took the seat next to the entrance and carefully avoided looking at the front seats. Indeed, they appeared to be empty, for Jennings and Derbyshire were crouching so low that nothing was visible. From a vantage point some two feet above the ground, Jennings had another look. He's sitting right at the back, he reported in a whisper, and he hasn't seen us. If those two fat ladies don't get off, he won't know we're here. So all we've got to do is to go on crouching like this and keep our heads down till Mr. Carter gets off. Then we'll be all right. Yes, but supposing he... Fares, please, said the conductor, doubled up as they were. They had difficulty in getting their fivepences out of their trouser pockets and the conductor was tapping his foot on the floor impatiently by the time they had succeeded. Two halves to the station, Jennings whispered softly. Eh, hey, said the conductor. Speak up, I can't hear you. Two halves to the station, please, the boy repeated, not daring to raise his voice. What about a chum, laryngitis? asked the conductor. Yes, croaked Jennings hoarsely. Can't you pal talk either? Where are you going, son? The man boomed at Derbyshire. Derbyshire's lips framed the word station, but no sound came. At the third attempt, the conductor's lip reading improved and light dawned. Oh, station, he said. Well, why don't you say so? Two sore throats to the station, two five fences. I thank you. He punched their tickets and returned to the rear platform. Several times the bus stopped. Passengers came and went but Mr. Carter remained. The combined wishful thinking of Jennings and Derbyshire was quite unable to budge him. Three times, new passengers advanced to the front seat, believing it to be empty, and were startled by the crouching figures who mimed at them to go away. At every stop, Jennings made a cautious survey. Surely he'd get off soon. But by now they had reached the town, and Mr. Carter was still sitting next to the exit. No amount of limping could deceive him at so close a range. The bus stopped again. Station, station, called the conductor. Hurry along, please. Oh, golly, what shall we do, moaned Derbyshire. We'll just have to go a bit further, said Jennings. The conductor was anxious to be helpful. Station, he yelled down the bus. Hey, chum, didn't you want the station? Oi. Don't take any notice, whispered Jennings. Pretend you haven't heard. But the conductor was not to be put off. You will add stiff as well as dumb, he inquired, approaching. We, we, we're going a bit further, said Jennings. OK, said the conductor, ringing the bell. How far are you going? I, I, I don't know yet. I hope to know soon. The conductor scratched his head. Better drop you off at the hospital, he decided, and get those sore throats looked at. That'll be another 2p. Oh, goodness, said Derbyshire. We haven't got any more money. Ah, you'll have to get off then, won't you? But, but we can't get off, urged Jennings desperately. You don't understand. Look, couldn't you give me your address and I'll send the fare on to you? Huh, I've heard that one before, said the conductor. Well, come on. Are you going to have another ticket or aren't you? Can I be of any help, inquired Mr. Carter politely. Oh, gosh, said Jennings. Oh, golly, said Derbyshire. Mr. Carter gave them a friendly smile. Would you mind stopping, he said to the conductor. I think we've all gone quite far enough. They alighted in silence, 
and the two boys stood dejectedly on the pavement as the bus proceeded on its way. Now we'll have to catch a bus going the other way, said Mr. Carter. I'm glad you've got your glasses back, Derbyshire. You look quite lost without them. Uh, oh, sir, do you mean you saw us? I'm afraid I couldn't help it. Next time you hide behind a hedge, try to remember that it's useless to put your head down if you leave your other end sticking up. W will there be an awful row, sir? Good gracious, no. We all make mistakes. The best thing to do is to try and profit by them. Mr. Carter went down the road to inquire the time of the next bus back. I see Darby, said Jennings, when the master was out of earshot. He's jolly decent, really, isn't he? Yes, I, I thought he'd kick up no end of a fuss. Jolly lucky for us he wasn't Mr. Wilkins. Lucky? What about my bashing up? Are you frightened? asked Derbyshire. Well, just a bit. So do you be. But I'm jolly well not going to tell Mr. Carter. Across the road was a sweet shop, and something about it rang a bell in Jennings' brain. Why should it appear vaguely familiar when he had never seen it before? S. Valentian's son was inscribed in red letters above the shop front. and The sign in the window informed the world that father and son specialised in the manufacture of genuine Brighton rock. Jennings remembered. That must be the shop which Temple had visited when he'd foxed out the previous term. An idea buzzed in his brain, ticked over for a few seconds, then roared into action. I see Darby, he said with growing excitement. That sweet shop over there. I, I don't feel much like sweets at the moment, thanks, said Derbyshire. But that's the shop Temple went to when he foxed out. Well, you don't expect me to get excited over that, do you? No, but I am, said Jennings as the idea assumed a practical shape. I can see how to... Oh, gosh, we haven't got any money. I wonder if Mr. Carter will let me have some more out of my bank. When the master returned to say that the bus didn't leave for an hour, he was a little puzzled about Jennings' insistence on buying Brighton Rock. Surely he had plenty of sweets in his tuck box, hadn't he? Yes, sir, replied Jennings earnestly, but that won't do. It's got to be Brighton Rock and it's got to be in one of Valenti's bags with the name on. Mr. Carter looked searchingly at the boy's anxious expression. Is this rock very important? he asked. Yes, sir, it's vital, Jennings assured him. For a moment, Mr. Carter considered, and then he decided not to ask any questions. He made further inroads on Jennings' bank and handed him five pence. Cool, thank you, sir. Thank you ever so. Jennings hopped on one leg in excited gratitude and dashed across the road. Derbyshire watched him, wondering what all the excitement was about. Then he looked at Mr. Carter doubtfully. Are you going to take us back to school, sir? he asked. That was the general idea, Mr. Carter informed him. Derbyshire sighed. Oh, well, perhaps it won't be so bad. They, they say the first five years are the worst, don't they? After Jennings' visit to Valenti's, Mr. Carter took them to a cafe, explaining that it would be bedtime before they got back to school. Baked beans on toast restored their spirits and loosened their tongues, and Mr. Carter was able to convince them that the rigours of school life were not nearly as bad as they had imagined. <laughs> on earth can those new chaps have got to, said Temple. I haven't seen them all afternoon. Perhaps they're in the sick room, suggested Venables. I say, weren't you going to bash one of them up before tea? Gosh, yes, I forgot all about it. Never mind, I'll do it tomorrow. Here lies Jennings, R.I.P. Who's talking about me, demanded Jennings, sailing into the dormitory as though he'd just bought the place. He was followed by a smiling Derbyshire. Hey, where have you two been? asked Atkinson. The dawn bell went hours ago. And where were you at tea? Venables demanded. You missed some super wizard muck. I had four helpings. Temple didn't like the self-satisfied expression on Jennings' face. I know where they were, he said. They've been hiding from me because they were afraid of getting bashed up. Gosh, no, said Jennings. I never gave you a thought. I've had other things to think about. 
As a matter of fact, two chaps, and he tried to make his voice sound casual, as a matter of fact, Derbyshire and I foxed out. We went into town on a bus. Silence followed this incredible statement. Temple was the first to recover. You, you never did, he said in a hushed voice. Yes, didn't we, Darby? Jennings turned to his fellow conspirator for confirmation. That's right, said the conspirator. We went out disguised. It was super. And you cut tea as well? Gosh, that'd have been the most frantic hoo-ha if you'd been caught. I couldn't have cared less, said Jennings. I'm that sort, really. And Darbish is a bit of a desperado in his way, too. Oh, you, you, you shouldn't say that, simpered the desperado modestly. Of course he is, agreed Venables. I think you're both jolly plucky. Temple isn't the only one, after all. Good old Jen. But Temple wasn't going to relinquish his crown as easily as all that. Don't you believe them, he broke in. They're just making it up. I bet they can't prove it. Go on, he jeered. Just you prove it. I defy you to. Jennings produced the bag of rock with a flourish. Certainly, he said. Have a bit of Brighton rock. I got it at the Lentis. Temple was so surprised that he couldn't speak, and Jennings passed the bag round with a lordly gesture. Sorry to pinch your idea, he went on. But we improved on it rather with our disguises, and it was just as well we had them too. He paused just long enough to produce the required effect, because Mr. Carter got on the bus. Again, the remark was received in stunned silence. Here, obviously, was some superman. What? asked Venables when he'd recovered from the shock. Oh, yes, said Jennings, as though evading the authorities was child's play. But it was all right. We kept our heads, you see. Down, amended Derbyshire. What's that, Darby? We kept our heads down. And here we are to tell the tale, added Jennings, wisely leaving much of the tale untold. Have another bit of rock at it. It's genuine, all right. See the name on the bag. Cool, thanks, Jennings. Hand it round, Derbyshire, Jennings went on. Want another bit, Venables? Cool, thanks, said Venables. I say, Jennings, he continued between mouthfuls. Look, you can share my basin if you like. You and Derbyshire. No, have mine, Jennings, came from Atkinson, equally anxious to do homage to the famous. Go on, and you and Derbyshire can go first. Well, that's awfully decent of you, Atkinson, said Derbyshire, basking in glory. But Jennings broke in. No, I think we'll have Temple's Basin. Temple's throne tottered and fell. Well, yes, all right, Jennings, he heard himself say. Good, I'll wash first, then Derbyshire, then you. Well, uh, OK then, Jennings. And uh, <laughs> no rot about bashing up, eh? Temple assured him that any mention of bashing up had been in the nature of a friendly joke. Jennings washed in a leisurely fashion and turned again to Temple. Actually, I'm feeling a bit fagged out after foxing into town. You might clean this basin out for Derbyshire and I finish washing, will you? This was the crowning humiliation but Temple's defences were shattered. Yes, Jennings. OK, Jennings. The crowd round the notice board parted to allow Mr Carter to pass through and pin the list of football teams on the board. The first practice of the term was due to start when afternoon school was over, and most of the new boys had been picked for the junior game. Derbyshire had a profound distrust of ball games. His experience was somewhat limited, as he had played football only once in his life, and what he chiefly remembered was that the ball travelled very fast and hurt when it hit you in the face and knocked your glasses off. I'm trying Jennings in goal, Mr Carter said. Where would you like to play, Derbyshire? Positions on the field meant nothing in Derbyshire's life, and this seemed a silly question. Surely there was only one place. I'd like to play on that field behind the gym, please, sir, he replied. 
It's next to the road, so I might be able to get some car numbers if they come close enough. Hmm. You'd better try outside left, Mr. Carter decided. Mr. Wilkins was taking Form 3 for maths that afternoon. During the latter part of the lesson, he told them all about triangles which were similar to one another in all respects. To demonstrate how practical the subject was, he invented a problem about a man who lived in a village with the unlikely name of A, and who wanted to cross a river to another village which rejoiced in the improbable name of B. It seemed that by walking a measured distance and taking two compass bearings from a church dedicated to St. C, the traveller was constructing two invisible triangles which enabled him to work out the breadth of the river D. All this Mr. Wilkins demonstrated on the blackboard. But Jennings was thinking about the game of football to follow. What have I just been saying, Jennings? The question shattered the footballing daydream like a pistol shot. Uh, you, you said that if you knew all about similar triangles, it helped you to cross a river, sir. Quite right. For a moment, Mr. Wilkins had thought that the boy had not been paying attention, but it seemed he was mistaken. And how exactly would you go about it, he inquired. Jennings thought desperately. Well, sir, I suppose you'd make big wooden ones so you could sit on one triangle and paddle yourself across with the other. Oh, said Mr. Wilkins. The trouble with you, Jennings, is that you're half asleep. When the bell rang for the end of school, Mr. Wilkins swung round from the blackboard and boomed, Right. Stop working, everybody. Put your books away quietly. Quietly, he roared as some unfortunate specimen let his desk lid fall with a bang. All out of the changing room to get ready for football. All except Jennings. He stays here. Oh, sir. Why, sir? Because you tried to be funny in my lesson, that's why. Hurry up, the rest of you. No running in the corridors. Anybody not changed in five minutes doesn't play. The forms scuffled out, trying to look as if they were hurrying without running. Jennings watched them unhappily. The thought of everyone except him enjoying themselves was too much. From the first game of the term, too, he'd been going to show them how well he could play. He was still at his desk, thinking bitter thoughts twenty-five minutes later when Mr. Wilkins returned to the room. I suppose you want to be out playing football, eh? Jennings nodded. Well, you've only got yourself to blame. Silly little boys who try to be funny in my lessons soon find that it doesn't pay. Mr. Wilkins glanced at his watch. By now, the football practice was nearly half over. Go on, then. Whip down and get ready before it's too late. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Jennings shot out of the classroom and unmindful of school rules, scampered along the corridors to the changing room. Wow! But he'd have to get a move on if he wanted to play. The game had started hours ago. There wasn't time to change properly and take everything off, so he put his white sweater on over the top of his pullover. He wasted precious seconds trying to pull his football shorts over the shorts he was already wearing, but they were too tight, so he rolled up his trouser legs a couple of inches and pulled his long white sweater down till it reached nearly to his knees and gave no sign of what he was wearing underneath. Socks were easier. The second pair went on over the top of the first without much difficulty and he had only to put his football boots on, and he'd be ready. Phew! It must be nearly half-time. Everyone else had gone out ages ago. Not quite everyone, though. For as he made a dive for his football boots, he saw Derbyshire sitting on the floor in front of the boot lockers. What on earth are you doing here, Derby? he demanded. It's these stupid football boots, replied Derbyshire. My mother tied them together by the laces when she packed them, so as I wouldn't lose one without the other. Uh, not that I wanted to lose both, he went on, in case his meaning should not be quite clear, uh, but she thought there'd be more chance of neither getting lost if Jennings cut short the explanation. Well, you haven't lost them, so why don't you put them on? I can't undo the knot, said Derbyshire sadly. I've been tugging at it for about twenty minutes, and the harder I tug, the tighter it gets. Gosh, yes, you have got it into a mess, agreed Jennings inspecting the four lace ends tied tightly together. But you'll just have to put up with it. It'll be an awful how-do-you-do if you don't turn up. 
I don't want a how do you do, said Darbyshire solemnly. What I really want is a how do you undo. Darbyshire thought that his prowess as a footballer would be severely handicapped if he had to play with both feet tied together. But as there seemed no alternative, he put on his boots and shuffled to the door. The tied laces permitted him to take a step of about ten inches, and assisted by Jennings, he proceeded in an ungainly hobble to the football field. They looked an odd pair, as Jennings' bulk was increased by his day clothes beneath his sweater, and as this garment was pulled down almost to his knees, it appeared as though he had forgotten to wear any trousers. Mr. Carter was taking the game, and decided not to waste any more time in demanding explanations of their late arrival. He sent Jennings to keep goal. And where did I say you were to play Derbyshire? he asked. Uh, you said I was to be left out, sir. Left out of what? I, I don't know, sir. Just left outside somewhere. Oh, yes, I remember, said Mr. Carter. Outside left, not left outside. Mr. Carter was too busy to notice Derbyshire's crippling progress to the left wing. It took him some time to get there, but finally he reached a spot near the touchline where he was out of the hurly-burly, and there he stood somewhat awkwardly at ease. Derbyshire rather liked playing outside left. It was peaceful and remote from the frantic battles of the midfield. It seemed unlikely that anyone would disturb the stillness by kicking the ball to this quiet backwater near the touchline. There were some wild flowers growing on the bank a few yards away, and he would have liked to wander off and pick them, but for the impediment around his ankles. Never mind. He would pretend that he was a prisoner in a chain gang, condemned to spend ten years with his feet securely. <gasps> the train of thought jolted to a halt. The worst was about to happen. Some ill-advised athlete had sent a pass out to the left wing, and the ball was coming straight at Derbyshire. Now, uh, now, what was it he was supposed to do? Oh, yes, kick the ball, boot the beastly thing as far away as possible, and hope that it didn't come back. It would be stretching the facts to say that Derbyshire kicked the ball, but the spirit was willing even though the flesh was weak and tied together at the ankles by boot laces. He drew his right foot back the full ten inches that his laces allowed and swung his boot forward as hard as he could. The impetus of the forward swing dragged the other foot up with it. Up into the air went both feet and Derbyshire fell flat on his back while the ball rolled harmlessly over the touch line. The boys who assisted the winger to his feet were almost helpless with laughter. <laughs> what happened, Derbyshire? they asked. Did you have a stroke? Oh, oh, no, nothing so serious, he assured them. It's just a sort of impediment that I'm suffering from. Mr. Carter took one look at the knots and cut the impediment with his penknife. <laughs> It was on the following Wednesday that Mr. Pemberton Oakes, the headmaster of Lindbury Court, decided to hold a fire practice. The rules governing an outbreak of fire were displayed in all dormitories, and practices were held at intervals. All boys stood quietly by their beds, a gong was sounded, and when various formalities had been attended to, they would proceed down the main staircase in an orderly file. The alternative was descent by the Davy escape. This consisted of a steel box screwed to the window frame and containing a roll of cable with a sling on the end. Placing the sling under the armpits, one lowered oneself into space from the window sill and descended gently to the ground as the lifeline was automatically paid out from above. It was a very popular undertaking, but as a rule it was used only under the supervision of the masters. We won't actually tell the boys to use the escape, the headmaster decided when explaining his plans in the staff room. We'll just say that the staircase is impossible and let them use their initiative. Mr. Pemberton Oakes led the way to the assembly hall where the school were awaiting his arrival. 
Um, for our practice this afternoon, we are going to assume there is an outbreak of fire on the top landing outside Dormitory 4, he began. Now, um, what is the first thing to do? Seventy-eight hands went up, and the headmaster noted that the absent hand belonged to Jennings. Well, um, Derbyshire, perhaps you can tell me. You use your intelligence, sir, said Derbyshire, paraphrasing fire rule number one. And if you can't think of anything intelligent, you call one of the masters and do what he says instead. Yes, uh, but supposing that no master is available. Again, 78 hands shot up, but Jennings was daydreaming of Lord's cricket ground, where, in imagination, he had just scored a century against the Australians in the most exciting test match for years. Mr. Pemberton Oaks decided that now would be the time to test the boy's initiative. He would put him in charge of the fire drill and see what happened. Let us assume, he continued, that instead of being half past two in the afternoon, it's half past two in the morning. And the boy in dormitory four, let us say Jennings, for example, awakens from sleep. The mention of his name recalled Jennings from Lord's, where he had just put himself on the bowl at the pavilion end. He came to with a start. I... I... I beg your pardon, sir? I said, Jennings awakens from sleep, repeated the headmaster. But uh, judging from your appearance while I've been speaking, I was beginning to think that you had gone into a state of hibernation for the winter. I trust that is not so. I, I, I don't know, sir. I don't know what hyper, um, or what you said means, sir. It applies to such creatures as toads, moles, bats, and apparently to some small boys, explained the headmaster. Derived from the Latin word haberna, meaning winter quarters, it means, well, think, boy, think. Jennings thought hard, but the cricketing daydream still hung about him. Well, Jennings, what does a bat do in the winter? It, uh, it splits if you don't oil it, sir, he said. The master took the blow without flinching and explained the rules of the drill. Jennings, waking from slumber in the middle of the night, was to find an imaginary fire. He was to assume that no master was at hand and that the stairs had fallen in. Having imagined the circumstances, everything else must be done exactly as though a fire had actually occurred. Yes, sir, but supposing... There will be no supposing. This is a test of your initiative, Jennings. I shall give you a few minutes to think out your plan of action. After that, you will sound the gong and I shall await the result with interest. As soon as the boys were in the dormitory, Jennings took charge. Now, all put your pyjamas on, he said. We're supposed to be hibernating to start with, and when we wake up, the room's full of smoke. Oh, yes, agreed Derbyshire. And I, I, I vote we soak our towels in the wash basins and tie them over our noses and crawl round and round the floor where the air's purer. Derbyshire was allowed to go out onto the landing with Jennings as assistant gong biffer, and there he proceeded to warn his friend how careful one had to be when dealing with an outbreak of fire. Jennings gave the matter some thought. Everything had to be done as though the fire were real, and not merely a headmaster's whimsical notion of the best way to spend the half-holiday. In an actual outbreak, of course, Mr. Cart would telephone for the fire brigade, but one of the hazards of the exercise was that Jennings' own initiative must take the place of help from a grown-up source. Surely, then, the headmaster expected him to summon the necessary assistance. That was what he must have meant when he had demolished the staircase with a wave of his hand. Probably he had already warned the fire brigade, and they were even now standing by with engines ticking over, waiting for the practice call. It stands to reason, Jennings argued. How else can we get out if we can't go down the stairs? The logic of this argument swayed Derbyshire. Neither he nor Jennings thought of the Davy escape. Never having used it, they vaguely imagined that the contraption on the window sill was some labour-saving device for polishing the floorboards. So, Derbyshire held the gong steady, and Jennings beat it with gusto. While the echoes were still resounding throughout the building, windows opened in the dormitories, lifelines whirred into action, and an orderly evacuation began in all dormitories, except one. For in number four on the top story, the boys, with their faces swathed in damp towels, were crawling round and round the floor on their hands and knees, according to instructions. 
Jennings sped along to Mr. Carter's room, which was on the top floor, so the difficulty of bridging the gulf left by the demolished staircase did not arise. He tapped on the door. No answer. The room, as expected, was empty. Jennings made for the telephone on the desk. What should he say? Well, he'd just ask them if they'd mind sending the turntable ladder as the stairs had fallen in, and there were some people to be rescued on the top floor. The clock on Mr. Carter's desk stood at ten minutes to three as Jennings dialed nine, nine, nine. Fire station, please, he said importantly. <laughs> Dunnambury Fire Station was situated in the centre of the town, some five miles from Linbury Court. It was normally a smart and efficient station, especially when leading fireman Archie Coupling was on duty. To him it was a matter of pride that branch pipes glistened and that hose was rolled with geometrical neatness. At half past two that afternoon, he went to inspect the turntable ladder to which he had just been assigned for the rest of the day. He was horrified by the sight that met his eyes. Tarnished brass, dirty wet hose, boots lying about anyhow. Never had he seen such an untidy appliance. Leading fireman Coupling blinked in dismay, and his expression was grim as he went in search of his crew. Fireman Long and Fireman Short, known somewhat obviously as Lofty and Shorty, were intrepid firefighters, but they had a habit of retiring to some out-of-the-way spot when the more unpleasant routine jobs had to be attended to. Coupling ran them to earth in the fire tower, where, comfortably seated on a pile of hose, they were mechanically stroking a standpipe with a polishing cloth in the interval of filling in their football coupons. Come on, he ordered. We're going to start work. We'll have every piece of equipment stripped off the turntable and cleaned, and all that wet hose scrubbed and replaced. Briskly, he led the way to the appliance with his fingers itching to get to work. Lofty and Shorty followed at a more dignified pace. Pity is rumbled us, said Lofty. Nice and warm in a tower it was, too. Come on, shouted the leading fireman. You don't get paid good money to hang about nattering all day. Everything off now. Branches, nozzles, standpipes, suction, bridging pieces, wrenches, all of it. Lofty decided that it was time he had a look at the carburettor. He was a good mechanic, and felt that when a particularly dirty job like hose scrubbing was on the programme, it was the privilege of good mechanics to devote themselves to some quiet task, such as inspecting plugs and testing leads. But the ruse was unsuccessful. Come on out of it, called Coupling. You can mess about under the bonnet when we've got all these hose scrubbed. The good mechanic's feelings were outraged. Put the jets chalked in the carburetor, he complained. We kept stalling all the way up the street when I took it out before dinner. If I don't get it clean, we'll be up a gum tree if we have to turn out to a job. That's right, Shorty agreed. Suppose we get a fire call. It was then that leading fireman Archie Coupling made his big mistake. Don't you worry about that, he said. Having the kid off for a few minutes isn't all that much of a risk. It's got to be a pretty big fire before they send the turntable. Soon the appliance had been stripped of all its equipment, and sounds of splashing from the yard outside announced that firemen long and short, having run out the dirty holes, were busily engaged in scrubbing it. At nine minutes to three precisely, the alarm bells shrilled out their urgent message. Fireman Long paused in the act of rolling a cigarette. Fire call, he said, stating the obvious. We shan't be wanted anyway, said Fireman Short, resting on the handle of his broom. So they didn't hurry, but watched with a leisurely interest as firemen came running from all quarters at the summons of the alarm. Bodies slid down poles, heads popped up through trap doors, and everywhere legs were running, feet were jumping into boots, and arms weaving themselves into tunics. A second later, an agonised figure shot out of the control room. It was leading fireman coupling wide-eyed with horror and dismay. Turntable ladder, he shouted as he raced down the station. Quick, quick, it's a turnout. 
The message he bore in his hand confirmed the tidings. Linbury Court School, it said. Persons trapped third floor. Turntable ladder required for rescue. We can't turn out to a fire with our kit all over the shop like a blinking jumble sale, gasped Shorty. What are we going to do? Bang it all back again, quick, yelled his leading fireman. Hurry up, hurry up, come on, give us a hand, he called to the other crews, who were now emerging from their appliances and taking their boots off. Get the engine started, Lofty. We've wasted a minute already. Faster, faster, he encouraged them as he led the work of piling on the equipment. Chuck it on anywhere for now. We'll sort it out when we get there. For goodness sake, get a move on. The entire station personnel hurried as they had never hurried before. They ran pell-mell with standpipes. They ran helter-skelter with branch holders. They ran full tilt with the suction hose. But leading fireman coupling eclipsed them all in the ferocity of his attack upon the job on hand. He pell-melled, he helter-skeltered, he full-tilted, until some two minutes later most of the apparatus was on board. Lofty was in the driver's seat with his hand on the self-starter, but the engine refused to respond. She won't have it, he shouted. It's that chalk carburetor. She won't start. Of course she will. Here, you blokes, give us a push. The other crews gathered round to push the heavy vehicle onto the slope in front of the fire station. Here, half a mo, cried Shorty. We can't wait any half mo's. But we ain't got no boots. What? You told me to take them all off, see, and we... Well, go and get them, then. Panting hard, Fireman Short reached the Wellington boots stacked by the wall. The neat line had been upset by someone in his efforts to hasten the loading, and the boots were all jumbled up. Never mind sorting them out, called Coupling. Take the first three pairs and sling them up. And get a move on for Pete's sake. It's five minutes since the bells went down. Shorty seized an armful of boots and climbed aboard. On the slope outside, the engine started somewhat uncertainly, and they backfired their way down the high street with the accelerator pressed hard down. It had taken them six minutes to get out. Archie blushed beneath his perspiration at the thought of it. And then the more serious side occurred to him. Persons believed trapped on top floor. And with the engine misbehaving like this, they could only make a shaky 15 miles an hour, and there were five miles to go. Beads of sweat broke out on his forehead at the thought of the trapped persons anxiously awaiting his arrival. It was as well for his blood pressure that he didn't know that the fire call was a false alarm. For two and a half miles, the turntable ladder crawled along at an uneasy 15 miles an hour, while Archie Coupling relieved his feelings by sounding the siren. Going uphill, the speedometer needle dropped back still further. She won't take it, said Lofty. She's conking. He rocked backwards and forwards in his seat, as though encouraging the wheels to reach the top of the slope. But the speed dropped to a crawl. The engine coughed apologetically and was silent. Lofty jumped down, hurled open the bonnet and got to work on the carburetor. It'll take me a few minutes, he said, busy with a spanner. The leading fireman flipped his fingers in exasperation. Well, there's no point in us sitting here like a couple of spare puddings. Come on, we'll be getting our boots on, Shorty. That'll save a bit of time when we get there. The fireman Short rummaged amongst the heap of Wellingtons and made a suitable selection for his left foot. Then he rummaged again, and an air of bewilderment spread across his features. That's funny, he said. I can't find any right boots nowhere. This here boots are left-footed in. So's this and so's this. Well, blow me if I haven't brought six left boots and no right ones. Leading fireman coupling groaned in despair. The headmaster surveyed the rows of boys lined up before him on the quad. Mr. Carter, he said, haven't you finished taking that roll call yet? They're all present except dormitory four, replied Mr. Carter. I can't think what's happened to them. The headmaster glanced at his watch. Three o'clock. It must be ten minutes since the gong sounded. What on earth can they be doing? 
Accompanied by Mr. Carter and Mr. Wilkins, he had watched the other dormitories descending on their escapes in an orderly manner. Everything had gone according to plan, except for the unexplained absence of dormitory four. Come along, Wilkins. We'll go and see what's happened, he said, and together the two masters hurried indoors and up the stairs to the top floor. Mr. Pemberton Oakes flung wide the door of dormitory four and stood rooted to the threshold by the sight that met his eyes. Instead of preparing for an orderly evacuation, Temple, Venables, Atkinson and Derbyshire, wearing pyjamas over their suits, were crawling round the floor on their stomachs. Their faces were swathed in dripping towels, which left a damp snail's trail behind them as they crawled. Jennings was staring expectantly out of the window. The headmaster's face fell like a barometer. What on earth are you boys crawling about like that for? Like veiled women of the East, the four crawlers arose. Derbyshire removed his yashmak. Please, sir, he said, the smoke's not so thick if you keep your nose on the floor and you can breathe. Breathe? Smoke? What are you talking about? And why are you wearing your pyjamas? You said it was the middle of the night, sir, replied Venables. It was my idea, sir, said Jennings. You said, pretend it was a real fire, and I thought you meant do everything properly, sir, like sending a message to... The headmaster had no time to waste in listening to long-winded explanations. He turned to Mr. Wilkins and said, These boys have no idea how to behave at fire drill. Will you kindly explain to them the working of the Navy escape? Jennings glanced at his watch. It was well past three o'clock. That settles it, he thought. If the firemen were coming, they'd have been here by now. But Jennings was wrong. On a lonely stretch of road some two and a half miles away, Fireman Long was putting the finishing touches to his handiwork. The repair had taken him longer than he had thought, and the delay had done nothing to improve leading Fireman Coupling's frame of mind. It was quarter past three when Lofty leapt back into the driver's seat and pressed the starter. She's OK now, he said. The engine leapt to life, and in his skilful hands the speedometer crept up fifty, sixty, seventy miles an hour. But whatever their speed now, nothing could make up for earlier delays. You haven't half done it this time, leading fireman coupling, Esquire, the driver shouted, his voice scarcely audible above the wailing of the siren. You haven't half boxed it all up nicely, getting to a fire half an hour late and all wearing left-footed boots. I wouldn't be in your shoes when we get back. I wouldn't mind whose shoes I was in, said Shorty, clinging to the ladder for dear life, so long as they weren't these here left-handed gumboots. They aren't half letting me chillblains know about it. Seventy-three, seventy-four, seventy-five miles an hour read the speedometer as they streaked through the countryside on their life-saving pilgrimage. When Dormitory 4 had shed their slumber well, Mr. Wilkins began his explanation. Now, the way this, um, this escape works is extremely simple, he began. This round metal thing is a container. It contains a coil of cable. And uh, protruding through this aperture here... What, sir? asked Temple. Sticking out of this hole, amended the lecturer. Is a strap or sling which goes underneath your armpits. And this um, gadget here is, a, is an adjuster which you move up and down if you want to adjust it. In other words, it's, uh, in other words, it's adjustable. What's it just able to do, sir? inquired Venables innocently. I didn't say it was just able to do anything. Well, what's the good of it, sir, if it doesn't do anything? It does do something, said Mr. Wilkins irritably. You, you slide it along, you sling it along the slide, or rather you slide it along the sling to tighten the strap across your chest so that you don't uh, slide out of the sling. Mr. Wilkins felt he wasn't explaining it very well decided to cancel the lecture in favour of a demonstration. He fastened himself into the sling and climbed out onto the windowsill. Now, now, now watch me carefully, you boys, boomed the demonstrator, and you'll see how easy it is. They crowded round the window as Mr. Wilkins launched himself into space and disappeared from view with his commentary still running. Now, I want you to observe how I push myself. The running commentary suddenly ceased. So did the word of the escape 
as an unrehearsed incident enlivened the proceedings. Gosh, it stopped, said Temple. Uh, stand back, you boys, said the headmaster, thrusting them aside and leaning out of the window. An unfortunate occurrence had marred what would otherwise have been a perfect demonstration. Mr. Wilkins, directing his comments to the window above his head, had omitted to push himself gently away from the wall, and the strap across his chest had caught on a thick branch of ivy. To his dismay, he found himself suspended in mid-air. He struggled to free himself, but the weight of his body kept the cable taut, and without a foothold, he was unable to slacken the tension and unhook himself. The branch of ivy was strong and showed no tendency to break. It was an uncomfortable and not a dangerous situation, and certainly not one to assist the dignity of the demonstrator. What's happened, Mr. Wilkins? inquired the headmaster, somewhat unnecessarily. Grunts and gasps drifted up to the group in the dormitory above. It's, it, it, it's, it's no good, called Mr. Wilkins, after further battle with the ivy. The, the slings caught tight, I can't get any leverage on the branch to, to break it. Action, prompt and immediate, was the watchword of Mr. Pemberton Oates. He seized on the nearest boy, who happened to be Jennings, and gave his orders in a crisp and concise manner. Quick, he said, run and find Robinson and tell him to bring a ladder. Explain that Mr. Wilkins is suspended on an obstinate tendril of ivy. Jennings rushed off to find the odd job man while the headmaster satisfied himself that Mr. Wilkins was in no immediate danger. You're, you're sure you can't release yourself? he called. A disgruntled snort from below implied that if Mr. Wilkins had been able to release himself, he would have done so, and that he was not dangling sixty feet above ground purely for his own selfish pleasure. Rotten luck, isn't it, sir? said Atkinson. Most unfortunate, agreed the headmaster. I shall get Robinson to cut all this ivy down first thing tomorrow. What's that you said? called Mr. Wilkins from below. I was saying I shall have the ivy cut down tomorrow. Tomorrow? echoed Mr. Wilkins. But bless me, I, 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 I can't stay here all night. After that, they tried to pull Mr. Wilkins up. They heaved and gasped and strained, but the odds were against them for the branch of ivy was holding the sling in such a way that pulling on the cable merely tightened its grip. Soon Jennings returned with the news that Robinson couldn't help. The longest ladder on the premises wouldn't reach anywhere near the top floor. Most annoying, exclaimed the headmaster. We ought to have a longer ladder. I shall order one the next time I go to London. From below, Mr. Wilkins demanded to be kept abreast of the latest developments. What did you say? he called. I said, I'm going to order a ladder the next time I go to London. Yes, but good heavens, I, I mean, dash, I, 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 I can't go and hang on here all that time. This is ridiculous, said the headmaster. He couldn't leave Mr. Wilkins to cool his heels indefinitely. Ah, he had an idea. I shall telephone the fire station immediately, he said, and ask them to send a long ladder at once. Please, sir, Jennings said. I've done that already. You've telephoned for the fire brigade, said the headmaster in surprise. Yes, sir. You see, I was trying to use my initiative, and I thought, thank you, Jennings. I, I congratulate you. Your action was perhaps a little unorthodox, but with Mr. Wilkins in his precarious position, I'm inclined to agree that there was no time to be lost. Mr. Pemberton Oakes looked at Jennings with a new interest. He had misjudged him. How many other boys, he wondered, on hearing that Robinson's ladder was too short, would have had the initiative to rush to the telephone and call for assistance? Jennings felt he ought to explain that he had made the telephone call nearly half an hour before, and that the fire brigade weren't coming anyway. But he decided that this was not the best moment for explanations. Let me see, said the headmaster, consulting his watch. Let us say that it is three or perhaps four minutes since you telephoned. They had roughly five miles to come, so we can hardly expect them to be here for another... He broke off as a distant wailing of a fire siren caught his ear. It was not often that the headmaster betrayed his feelings, but now his eyes opened wide in bewilderment. There could be no doubt about it. The wailing was louder now. In two strides he reached the window 
and was just in time to see a fire engine swing round the corner and come tearing up the drive. Bless my words, fail me, he said, and hurried out to direct operations from below. What an amazingly efficient brigade, he thought, as he took the non-existent stairs two at a time. We must have left the fire station a split second after receiving the call and streaked along the road like lightning. The appliance skidded round the bend of the drive on two wheels and pulled up outside the main entrance with a screeching of brakes. Can't see any fire, said Lofty. I reckon it's got tired of waiting and burnt itself out. The headmaster was approaching at a brisk pace. Archie leapt smartly to meet him. Turn table ladder, leading fireman coupling in charge, he said. He was surprised at the warm welcome expressed in the headmaster's answering smile. He had been expecting a fusillade of complaints about the unforgivable delay. Excellent, excellent, beamed the headmaster. You have been quick. We sent for you because one of our masters is in a state of suspension. He led the way round the corner and pointed upwards to where Mr. Wilkins appeared to be flowering amongst the ivy. Is that all, sir? inquired the leading fireman. It's enough, isn't it? I mean, no fire? Anything like that? No, no fire, nothing like that. It seemed too good to be true. In a matter of seconds, the turntable was in position. Get to work, shouted Archie. In his skilful hands, the ladder responded like some prehistoric monster roused from sleep. Strong legs unwound themselves and planted feet of steel firmly on the ground to take the strain of the monster's weight. The ladder rose from the gantry as though the beast were lifting its head and stretching its serpentine neck. By this time, the entire school had congregated on the quad. With bated breath and eyes agog, they watched the monstrous neck spanning the distance between the ground and Mr. Wilkins. Gently, the neck craned forward and came to rest alongside him. With his feet solidly on the ladder, it was the work of a moment for Mr. Wilkins, assisted by Lofty, to free himself from the sling, and a minute later both men were safely on the ground. A buzz of excited chatter broke the tension as soon as the rescue was completed, and Mr. Wilkins was unable to evade the throng that crowded round him. Oh, you, you are lucky, sir. Was it nice up there, sir? Sir, did you mean to get stuck so as we could see how the fire brigade works, sir? Yes, sir. sir. Are you going to do it again, sir, because you didn't really finish coming down on the sling, sir? All right, all right, all right. Be quiet, said Mr. Wilkins. He turned to leading fireman coupling and rendered suitable thanks for his deliverance. That's all right, said Archie. I'm only sorry you had to stay up there so long. Now that the rescue was over, Archie had time to think. So far, they had had a lucky escape. But the unheard of delay of 30 minutes in answering the call was a very serious matter. He turned to Mr. Pemberton Oakes. Excuse me, sir, he said. I suppose there's no chance of your overlooking what time you arrived, is there? Yeah, there, there certainly isn't, replied the headmaster genially. You mean... You're going to report to the fire station? Most definitely. Archie's spirits dropped. There would be an official inquiry. He would have to write endless reports and would be certain to find himself charged with neglect of duty. He forced his attention back to the headmaster and listened with growing amazement to his words. What on earth was the chap talking about? And, and I shall certainly write to your commanding officer, he was saying and tell him how impressed I was by the speed of your arrival. Why, you must have left the fire station in a flash and swept through the town like a rocket. Archie rocked on his heels and gripped the turntable for support. And your gallant crew as well, continued the headmaster, indicating fireman long and short with a sweep of the hand. I shall certainly mention the verve and aplomb with which they carried out the rescue. Leading fireman coupling felt it was time to go before any more questions were asked. If ever there was a time for letting sleeping dogs lie, this was it. Just as they were about to start, Jennings turned to Derbyshire and said, I wonder why all firemen seem to have two left feet. Of course, it must be super for playing outside left, but how would you keep in step when you were doing P.E.? 
Mr. Pemberton Oakes overheard the frivolous comment. If only you had some sensible question to ask Jennings about the, the Davy Escape, for instance, he turned to the leading fireman. I've no doubt you know a great deal about escapes, don't you? Archie nodded. That's right, he said, and I reckon I've just had a very lucky one. Lofty let in the clutch, and the appliance disappeared round the bend of the drive. Mr. Carter was sitting in his room one evening towards the end of term, editing the boys' contributions for the school magazine. The quality of the writing varied considerably. There were poems, articles about hobbies and sports and school expeditions, and accounts of simple everyday happenings which the boys had thought worthwhile to place on record. Mr. Carter was keen to encourage any piece of writing that expressed a boy's feelings on some topic that appealed to his imagination. But there were limits. He was reading Venable's article on Beetles I Have Reared when he heard furtive whispers outside his door. Bagged you, Lock Derbyshire, said the first whisperer. Oh, no, no bags you. It's mostly my story, so I don't like to seem too eager he heard the second voice reply. Well, I'll just do a soft biff then, in case he's busy and doesn't want to be disturbed. Mr. Carter called, Come in, quickly, to forestall the thunderous onslaught on the door panels that he knew would follow this announcement. I am terribly busy, he said. Oh, sh shall we hoof off then, sir? Shall you what? Oh, sorry, sir, I mean, uh, shall we take our departure, sir? No, 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 no. What is it you want to see me about? Jennings produced a slim green exercise book. Inscribed in wobbling block capitals on the cover was the legend, The Adventures of Flixton Slick, Super Sleuth, by J.C.T. Jennings and C.E.J. Derbyshire, copyright reserved. It's a story we've written for the school mag, sir, Jennings explained, thrusting the exercise book under Mr. Carter's nose. It's ever so exciting. Mr. Carter glanced through the pages of Flixton Slick Super Sleuth. Hmm. It seemed a poor reward for a term spent in encouraging them to enrich their minds. Why couldn't they write something that didn't depend upon impossible situations and hair's breadth escapes? Why this untidy pile of corpses that littered every page? A passage on page three caught his eye, and he read aloud, so Flixton Slick left Scotland Yard with three uniformed constables and went to the warehouse. He burst in. The silent shadow was hiding in a corner. When he saw Flixton Slick, he whipped out a revolver. Crack, crack, crack. Three shots rang out. Two policemen fell dead, and the third whistled through his hat. That, that, that doesn't mean the policeman whistled through his hat, sir. Derbyshire put in for the sake of clarity. It means the bullet went through Flixton. Oh, shut up, Darby. It's obvious what it means, Jennings broke in. After all, if two of your friends got shot dead, you might take off your hat as a mark of respect, but you wouldn't whistle through it. Besides, policemen wear helmets, not hats, don't they, sir? Mr. Carter sighed. I'm sorry, he said, but I can't possibly put this sort of stuff in the magazine. He was conscious of their unspoken reproach, their bitter disappointment. Derbyshire gazed beadily at him through his glasses, and Jennings stood on one leg, massaging his right calf with his left foot. Tell me, said Mr. Carter, have you ever met any detectives or criminals? No, sir. Then you can't expect anything you write about them to be convincing. If you're going to write a story for the magazine, choose a subject that you really know something about. Jennings and Derbyshire looked at each other, and their glances clearly showed what they thought of the suggestion. Well, what could we write about then, sir? Jennings asked. Mr. Carter considered. Well, think of all that's happened since you came here, and try describing your first term at school. 
Oh, sir, that'd be silly, objected Jennings. Nothing ever happens at school. No murders, no crooks, never anything exciting. And everybody here is so ordinary. We never get a chance to do anything worth writing about. Oh, I don't know, replied Mr. Carter. You think it over. You might call it uh, something like Jennings goes to school. Jennings didn't agree. It was all very well for grown-ups to make absurd and impossible suggestions. He'd like to see them do it. Well, sir, he said at length, and his tone was most polite. Don't think I'm trying to be critical, sir, but if you think it's such a good idea, why don't you do it yourself? I might, Mr. Carter replied unexpectedly. It's certainly an idea. Disappointed, the two authors took their leave. Outside in the corridor, where they mistakenly supposed that they were out of earshot, Jennings and Derbyshire expressed their views on Mr. Carter's shortcomings as a literary critic. I think he's off his runners, said Derbyshire. Huh, he's worse than that, said Jennings. He's just got no idea. Pathetic. Why, I bet you a million pounds nobody in their senses would ever want to read stories about chaps like us. On the other side of the door, Mr. Carter smiled as he filled his pipe. Wouldn't they, he murmured? I'm not so sure. <laughs>